All right, so like I said, we'll go through Chapter 6. Uh, my review of Chapter 6, I don't think you guys are going to have a problem with it. It's not too bad. Um, it's kind of like Chapter 5. You think about Chapter 5, what it did is it kind of expanded upon some things we learned in the earlier chapters. Chapter 6 is the same way, but instead of working with the discrete probability distributions, it's the continuous probability distributions. Uh, and like I said, it's, it's pretty doable. And again, what I love about this book is that he... He kind of teaches you all the math, and then he says, here's how you can do it in Excel, right? And so for most of the problems, we can, we can use Excel. Um, I, I will say, as a, a proud parent type of moment, that I, I'm really pleased with the level of most of your, 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 your uh, Excel skills. Uh, when I think of how you guys started in Accounting 1 to what you can do on Excel now, it, it's like night and day. And so to me, that is more important than knowing any of these formulas because you're not going to use most of these formulas ever, but you will have to use Excel to devise a means of, of solving problems. Um, and you'll know enough of this that if it comes up, you'll be like, I learned that, I can Google it, I can read a little bit about it, and then I could probably still do it. And that's really what matters in, in real business, uh, is being able to function. Uh, and it's not very often that I'm called upon to find the probability of a normal probability distribution or whatever, but anyway. So we, in discrete, remember that everything was whole numbers. And so that's kind of what a graph of it would look like with the whole numbers. Uh, whereas in a continuous probability distribution, uh, there's in essence an infinite number of data points because it can be any number in between the whole numbers too, right? And so if you want to go to to more and more, uh, what would you call it, more and more detail, you could in essence go to a... I guess you'd call it a, a, a number of possibilities that is endless. You could go to infinity. And so that's the big difference between the two. You can read that. If you want, I'll read it to you. Continuous random variables are outcomes that take on any numerical value in an interval as determined by conducting an experiment. They're usually measured rather than counted, whereas when we did the discrete variables, they were counted rather than measured, right? The number of people that came in, the number of calls that were made, some things like that. Examples of continuous data include time, distance, and weight, the purpose of this chapter, blah, 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 blah. Okay, you can read that. Done? Good, moving on. All right, maybe I'm moving on. Continuous random variables can take on any value within a specified interval. Because there are an infinite number of possible values, the probability of one specific value occurring is theoretically equal to zero. This is actually an interesting thing. As I was reading the textbook for this chapter, like reviewing it, I was like, that kind of made me think about, about it. So if I have, in essence, an infinite number of options within an interval, like, right, like how, many, how many numbers are between zero and 100? Well, you could say whole numbers, it's... 100, right, or 99 in between those two. But if I'm going to include decimals, really it's an infinite number of points in between there. Kind of like you never really get to a place, right, if you're walking toward it, you're halfway there, and then you're halfway there again, and you're halfway there again, and that can end up doing that indeterminately. So because of that fact, then the probability of having any one point occur within an interval is essentially zero. It's so low, it's one out of infinity, which is essentially zero, or approximately zero. That's an interesting thing that kind of makes these different from the discrete variables. Not kind of, it does make them different. Um, so you, we can't do probabilities based on individual values in an interval when we're using continuous data. Instead, probability is represented by an area or a range of data. So this chapter splits into three different types of probability distributions. A distribution just means how the data falls. We've learned about normal distributions already, right? That's the bell curve, where the data is evenly distributed around a mean and in descending, I guess, descending probability as it gets further away from the mean. That would be our normal distribution. Uh, it's pretty amazing, actually, in life how many things tend to just 
conform to that distribution, especially over time and given lots of data. There's an exponential distribution, which is shaped kind of like a downward sloping curve. All right. And there's a uniform distribution, which is shaped kind of like a, almost like a box. And I'll, you'll see each one of them. Uh, but each of these have different properties. And so they want to cover them each in separate sections. Oh, I guess I didn't have to tell you what they're shaped like. There they are. Did my descriptions do them justice? Or are they more beautiful than you imagined from the words that I was able to, the meager words with which I was able to describe their beauty? Like that. All right. All right, so this is actually pretty interesting. The normal probability distribution is useful when the data tend to fall into the center of the distribution. Exponential are used to describe data where lower values tend to dominate and higher values don't occur very often. And uniform describes data where all the values have the same chance of occurring. So that's what that means. That's what those shapes mean. OK? Not in this chapter. But you would imagine there could be some, right? Um, so it's interesting to me that, that these are the three they choose uh, to, to focus on. But it doesn't seem important impossible where higher values would tend to dominate. And it would, in essence, take on just the reverse of the exponential curve, right? It would come that way. Uh, and we see those in economics all the time. So, so that, you know, again, with me not being an expert in this field, and, and I won't say I'm learning right along with you because I've had this class and I've had a graduate level class and the same stuff, um, and I've read the book ahead of you. So I'm a little ahead of you, but it's interesting for me to, to read the author and then say, why did the author choose to only consider these functions? And I'm sure there's a mathematical reason behind it. Probably that mathematically it's not so different if it's this, right? Yeah. But, uh, you know, since that would be to a negative exponent, I guess it would just be to a positive exponent if it was shaped the other way. And maybe, um, again, since they know we're not going to know all this stuff by rote by the end, they're, they're introducing enough concepts to get us uh, to where they need us. Yeah, I do that all the time. When I read textbooks, uh, when I read my scriptures, I ask myself, why is this included in here? Like, of all the things that a person could have put in there, why did they choose to put this? Uh, and it's a, it's a valuable question sometimes. Other times, it just makes you say, why? All right. So let's look at normal probability distributions. We've already worked with them a little bit. This, I think it was in chapter three or four. Um, so we know the characteristics. Bell-shaped, the mean falls right in the middle, and we learned about standard deviations. You can read the rest if you want, but that's what all that's telling you. More characteristics. Half of the probabilities will lie above the mean, half below, because of the way it's shaped, right? And the left and right sides, they extend indefinitely. And they never quite hit the x-axis. So what's cool about normal distributions is really if you know the mean and you know the standard deviation, then that fully describes its shape. The mean is going to tell you where it sits on the x-axis. And the standard deviation is going to tell you how wide or skinny the curve is. Okay. I guess that's not cool, but for me it seems kind of cool. All right. <laughs> I like things that are predictable. They give you the probability density function. There it is. It has some constants in it. It's kind of ugly looking. But if you had to, you could probably figure it out. That's, that's how all this is. You could, what was that? Oh, bless you. Uh, I'm sorry that you're sick. All right. All right. So how do we calculate probabilities with normal distributions? So any normal distribution with any mean and any standard deviation can be transformed into a standard normal distribution. What a standard normal distribution, or Z, is, is in essence we just convert our X units. The X units are the real units. So whether we're, we're measuring time or we're measuring distance or whatever we're doing, if we convert that all to the z-score for it, 
Remember with a z-score, you'll have a mean of zero always, and then plus or minus in standard deviations. So really, you could take any x unit and figure out, once you know what the standard deviation is in x's, you could convert it to a, a z unit, right? If you know that uh, 25 minutes is the same as a z-score of two, or two standard deviations greater than the mean, you could do that for any point in the data. You could say, here's what its z-score is, and you could replot the whole thing. It would still follow the normal curve, but now the mean would be shifted to zero, and it would be plus or minus in standard deviations, okay? We've learned about z-scores already. You may have to do some review, but they're not hard. There's the formula, x minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. That gives us the z. Z-scores are negative for values of x that are less than the mean, and they're positive for values that are greater than the mean. Remember the book told us before that z-scores don't have any real units, and I said that's a lie. Z-scores units are standard deviations. That's what the unit is. It's this many standard deviations above the mean or below the mean. That's the unit. So our z-score at the mean would equal zero. It would not be above or below the mean. All right, when the original random variable x follows a normal distribution, z-scores also follow a normal distribution. I just said that. Here's an example. The time customers spend on the phone for service follows a normal distribution with a mean of 12 minutes and a standard deviation of 3 minutes. What is the probability that the next customer who calls will spend 14 minutes or less on the phone? All right, so we know the mean. We know the standard deviation. We can find a z-score. That's so uh, for the num for the x of 14. That wasn't hard. So if x equals 14, that is 0 0.67 standard deviations above the mean. Still doesn't give us the probability though, right? It just tells us, in essence, what we did there is we converted the x of, what did they say it was, 14, into a z of 0 0.67. Does that make sense? Okay. So now we need to figure out the probability. There's a couple things we can do. One, they have a standard normal probability table in Appendix A that's way easier to use than the tables from the last chapter. I'm glad that I wasn't the only one that had a problem with those tables. I'm sure if I spent more time in them, I could figure them out. But I was like looking at them, I'm like, screw this. I have Excel. And I just used Excel. Uh, that's probably not proper, huh, if I'm asking people. Actually, I didn't ask you to do it either. When, I, when people ask for help in class, I'm like, just use Excel, right? I had to whisper it. So the table provides a cumulative area under a standard normal distribution curve that lies to the left of the score, or 0.7486. Remember, because, of, because this is continuous data, if they had asked us back at the beginning, what is the probability the next customer will spend exactly 14 minutes on the phone? The answer would be zero, or so close to zero that we can't really approximate it with anything but zero. Because the chance of doing 14 minutes exactly is like trying to find one point out of infinity points. But because it's 14 or less, we're looking for that shaded part of the curve there, right? Everything below 14. So we can use the table for that. The way the table works is you take the z-score and across the top, I'm um, sorry, down the column, you take the first digit of the z-score and across the top, you take the second digit of the z-score and you find it. So it's super easy to use actually. You could also from that know that uh, the probability of finding above 14 uh, would be the complement of finding below 14, or 1 minus the probability of, of below 14. Also, with these continuous probability distributions, um, because, again, because the probability of any one point within the distribution being nearly zero, we don't have to worry about the whole greater than or equal to thing. So if the probability of, 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 of a value being less than or equal to 14 is the same as the probability of value being less than 14, which is kind of cool. He explains it really well in the book if you want to read that part. All right. So again, we find the necessary z-score, and then we can use the z-score to look it up in the book.
That's how we find those probabilities. Oh, and you can also do it in reverse, right? So I think that's what this example is. So here we have uh, a mean of 12 and a standard deviation of 3. Find a value of uh, that is, let's see, that is greater than, let's see, find the necessary z score. Sorry, find a z that is less than or equal to x equals 0 0.095. So when the z-value is needed to include 95% of the area under the curve. So we can look in the body of the table and find where it's close to 9.5. And then we can look out to see it's 1.6. And it's somewhere between the 0 0.4 and the 0 0.5. And we can come up with the z-score. Does that make sense? In other words, we can use the table in reverse. We did some of that in accounting, too. Uh, if, we, if, we know what the, if we know what the x is, 0.95, we can find 0.95 on the table. It happens to fall in between these two, and then we can approximate the z-score from that. All right. Probabilities for negative z-scores are the same way. I don't know why they did a whole separate thing on this. Uh, it's not any harder. It's the same thing because a negative z is just standard deviations below the mean. It's not really any weirder than that. So same stuff, um, easier actually when you're working on it. Remember we learned about the empirical rule back in whatever chapter that was? We've only done, this is only the sixth chapter, but I can't remember chapters already. So uh, my brain's just so full of all this stuff. Um, the empirical rule said, that the, the probability that something is going to fall within one standard deviation of the mean is 68%. And they did a whole proof as to why that was in the chapter. Probability it's going to fall between plus or minus two standard deviations, 95%, plus or minus three is 99.7%. Remember, this was different from Chebyshev's theorem, which, which worked for any type of distribution, so those numbers were lower. Um, but the empirical rule works for standard uh, or normal curves. Uh, and so that we can have a little bit more precision on how much is going to fall within those standard deviations. It's pretty amazing if you think about it. You know, plus or minus three standard deviations, anything outside of that is so rare that we usually just kind of discount it. All right. The probability between two intervals, pretty easy. In essence, all you do is you find the probability. Um, the first thing you do is you get the z-score for each one. Then you find the probability for each one, and then you subtract them. That will give you the probability between the intervals. Not hard. Here's what you really want to know. Norm.dist for normal distribution. I see Brittany writing this down. Uh, it's in your book as well if you, you, know, if you don't get it written down. But it's, it's normal distribution. We have the x, the mean, the standard deviation, and cumulative, true or false. Kind of a pattern to how these are all laid out, right? So here, if a normal distribution has a mean of 45 and a standard deviation of 5, what is the probability of x is less than or equal to 48? We put in normal distribution, 48, comma, 45, comma, 5, comma, true, and boom. That was incredibly easy. This is like our easy button, right? That's why we love it. Normal probabilities using Excel. We can also use what's called the norm.s.distribution or .dist function. Um, it finds the normal probabilities where the z-score is known. Then all you have to do is put in the z-score, and it finds the probability. In essence, it's just doing the table, right? Because uh, if you know the z-score, it's easy to find the probability. You can look at the table. Um, and again, Remember in accounting, I talked about developing like a sniff checker or, or like a sense of smell as to whether these things are about right. Well, you know the empirical rule says if something is plus or minus one deviation, then it's around, what was it, 67%, 68%. So if, if you get an answer, if something's got a z-score of, of two and you get an answer that's outside of what you would guess for that, then you know something's wrong. You know, so even for something like this, it's a little more abstract. We can start to develop a, I know if it's plus or minus one, 
you know, that whole range is 60 some odd percent, then, then you start to have a sense of what's normal, okay? And that just develops over time. The more people use it, people who use it all the time have a better sense of like when something's wrong. Um, I'm guessing Dane could probably approach a horse and tell something's not right with it, especially if he knows the horse. He's been around horses his whole life. I couldn't do that. I don't have any sense of, of that for a horse. Uh, but I do for children. Why? Because I've been around children the last 23 years. And uh, it's painful. But my wife has an even better sense of it because she's around them even more than I am. So it's, we, you know, we develop that sense for whatever we use. All right, so that was the normal distribution. The second is the exponential distribution. Um, there they say right there, it's another common continuous distribution. So apparently they're only focusing on a few of them. It's usually used to measure time between events of interest. For example, the time between customer arrivals, the time between failures in a business process. Here's the form formula for the exponential probability density function, where it's the mean times the constant 2.71828 to the power of the negative mean times x. I'll be honest with you, I do not know where that constant comes from. Yet another thing that I'll probably learn this semester and then not be as clueless as I am right now. Uh, anyway, I think like in real life, like, like I know lots of people who are engineers who never deal with the theoretical. They're only dealing with the hands-on part of it. So they work their whole career as an engineer, but never do tons and tons of, of the, they're not coming up with theorems and they're not, you know, recognizing constants that exist in the universe. And then there's a very small portion of engineers or scientists who are actually working on this sort of like the theoretical plane and can really tell you the origins of this constant or, or things like that. That's an interesting thing because they, they train everybody in it, but most people don't work on the theoretical side. Most people work on the application side and they don't care. They know the constant works. They apply the constant. Um, but there's the handful that do work on that side and they can tell you about all the ins and outs of of where this constant came from and where this, you know, the proofs behind it. Anybody know any of those mathematicians who love like trying to find proofs and do proofs or prove things, like prove why this constant works? There's a handful of them. I think uh, Mr. Stinchcomb here likes that. He loves that theoretical stuff. Uh, his brain works on that level. And so for people who think like that, they really enjoy talking to him. And for someone who's more of a, a grounded, like, an application, they find it very challenging to talk to a person who thinks that way, and vice versa, right? Um, anyway, so the formula for the exponential probability density function, there it is. Um, yeah, whatever that means. Uh, you can read that 10 times over and still not be sure what they meant. Uh, the shape of an exponential distribution depends on the value of the, um, of the the mean occurrences over the interval. So it's just one thing determines how that thing's going to be shaped. There's a little comparison to normal distributions on the side. They're always right skewed and not symmetrical. It's completely described by only one parameter. And the values of an exponential random variable cannot be negative. There's the formula for the distribution for the function. So for finding the probability, 1 minus the constant e to the negative number of interest times the mean number of occurrences over the interval. By now you've learned that the, the most challenging thing about this kind of work is just identifying the variables, right? Because once you've identified them, you can plug them in and make it work. There's the standard deviation. 1 over the lambda there. All right, so let's do an example rather than talk about the theories of all their, of all their formulas. The mean time between arrivals is 2 minutes. What is the probability that the next arrival is within the next 3 minutes? So on average, people show up every 2 minutes. What's the likelihood that somebody shows up in the next 3? Okay. So time between arrivals is exponentially distributed with a mean time between arrivals of 2 minutes or 30 per 60 seconds, 30 per 60 minutes on average. What is the probability the next arrival is within the next 3 minutes? 
Doesn't that math look intimidating? Not really. One arrival divided by two minutes, so 0 0.5 arrivals per minute. And then we can plug it into the formula. 1 minus e to the negative 3 times 0.5, or 1 minus e to the negative 1.5, right? That math isn't as hard as it looks at first. That's my point. And it comes out. You can also use exponential dot distribution or exponential dot dist, where you put the x, the lambda, and cumulative or not. Almost always we want true on these because of the nature. Again, because these are um, uh, because these are not discrete, because these are continuous, we don't ever want to find the value the the, uh, the probability of any one point because doing so is going to be zero or approximately zero. So we're almost always looking for cumulative. Um, if you do false, you're going to come up with the probability density function, which was that first one. Right there. Because if you think about it, it, look, it looks the same, but it's for any given point. All right. So there's our Excel. Finally, uniform probability distributions. Again, you know, I used to always ask why do math teachers give you like so many problems in the math set? It's because the, in high school they had never had any expectation of us understanding the deeper why is behind it. They just wanted us to be able to, to execute the function and make it happen. Um, and so they were trying, it was like almost like rote, right? They just wanted you to like do it over and over till you know that sine over cosine equals whatever. Remember all those? I've forgotten trig now. Uh, I can look them up though, so I'm fine. And I don't have to use it that very often. You know. But that's why they have us do so many of them. Uh, and the other thing is, is at college level where you, are, you have been had a little bit more experience in thinking now than you did when you were in sixth grade, you do start to understand some of the why just in doing a few of them. Probably not as deep as a mathematician would, but you don't need to know them as deep as a mathematician would. So you know, if, if you take anything away as you're doing it, try to just look for relationships between these things. Try to compare the things you're learning with things that you might see in the real world. And that's where you start to see the value in it. And it's very likely that with some stuff in statistics, you'll be like, just, I just don't see how I'm ever going to use this. And you'll probably be right. Um, but there may be a, a few items that come up later. And you'd be like, oh, yeah, I remember the concept. Help me now, Google. And you look up the formula, whatever, or you remember which function it is in Excel, and you do it. All right. So uniform probability distributions. With continuous uniform probability distributions, the probability of any interval in the distribution is equal to any other interval with the same width. In other words, because... Uh, in a uniform distribution, remember the shape of it was that kind of boxy shape. In essence, we're saying any interval that has the same width has the same probability of happening. Okay, they're all the same. That's what makes it uniform. Okay, so the formula for the continuous uniform probability density function is 1 over b minus a, where a is the smallest allowable continuous random variable and b is the largest allowable. Um, and that works if A is less than or equal to X and B is greater than or equal to X. If those things aren't true, then it's just going to equal zero. There's a probability, X2 minus X1 over B minus A, or the upper endpoint minus the lower endpoint over B minus A. Formula for the mean, A plus B over 2. Standard deviation, B minus A, over the square root of 12. I don't know why. Don't ask. I'm sure we could find it out, but I don't know off the top of my head. All right, let's do an example. Suppose the temperature of a solution varies with a uniform distribution between 55 and 155 degrees. What is the probability that the next measured temperature is between 70 and 90 degrees? All right. So again, the total area under the dis distribution must be 1, so the width is 100, and the height must be 0 0.1. What's the probability the next measured temperature is between 70 and 90? 
It's as simple as 90 over 70 over 155 minus 50, 0.2. So as confusing as it all sounded, it's as simple as this, which makes it pretty darn easy, actually, all right? So again, you know, I don't know what it is with math people who write math books that, that makes them think, we've got to make this sound really hard. Instead of just saying, like, you take the difference of the low and the end point of the first of the the target you're shooting for, what's the probability of this, and divide it by the difference between the, the low and the high points of the, uh, the first measurement. That's it. What do the mean in standard deviation? A plus B divided by 2. Standard deviation. I'm sorry, yeah, B plus A. Uh, oh, B minus A divided by the square root of 12. That's it. So easy to get the answer, a little harder to figure out what exactly that means until you've worked with it more and more. That's the end of the chapter. Like I said, I don't think you guys are going to have a real hard time with this chapter. Don't get caught up. If, if there's a, some part of it where you're like, I can't fully fathom what that means, don't get caught up in that. Right now, focus on being able to do it, and understanding will come to the level that I think is necessary for this. Um, I, I, I'm probably a horrible teacher because I told you like 10 times each day, it's okay if you don't fully fathom all this. I don't think they tell you that in math class, but I don't think people come out of the math statistics class with any deeper understanding of it than we do. We just know that it's okay for us to not fully understand it and that we're really trying to understand the interrelationships between things and some broader concepts. And if, if we get that much in the undergraduate stats class, then we're in good shape.